Good morning. It's good to see you all on this beautiful October Sunday. Um, next week, we have the, the joy and privilege of hearing from our chancel choir and youth choirs and chamber orchestra and organ, the uh, Maurice Durofle's Requiem in honor of the saints of DUMC who have died in the past year. So it'll be a beautiful Sunday in worship and uh, invite you to come and, and be a part of that. Bring a friend with you. It's a great opportunity to introduce them to um, life here at DUMC. Um, and also, if you were unable uh, to be here last week or haven't had the opportunity, couldn't do it last week, uh, the new facility is mostly open. So before you leave today, please wander through and um, take a look and get become, begin to get familiar with the, with the new space. Uh, this week we wrap up our series thinking about generosity, and as we do, I'm mindful of uh, the question that this text and really the passages that we've read throughout um, this, the past three weeks asks us to consider, and that is how we decide what belongs to God or to someone or to something else. How do we prioritize competing claims on our lives and on our time and on our treasure. It might have been nice had Jesus written a manual and given us that manual and say, follow this, do this, and life will go well, but, but he doesn't. Um, he, he gives us parables and stories and cryptic object lessons uh, about coins and emperors and, and God. So it can be a challenge to know how to prioritize the things that are to be rendered or offered to God and those things that belong elsewhere. So what are we to make of this strange little story that the church believed was important enough to, to remember, to write down, and to retell? It goes without saying, probably, but this encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees is about far more than citizenship and taxes. It is not a civics lesson. Um, that would be too easy. And, and, and in some ways, it's, it's not about the things that we often make it about at all. To build on last week's sermon, the, this encounter represents another way Jesus is asking his followers to consider who has our heart? It's about what it is that God requires of us and hopes for us, and, and what is a faithful response to God for all that God has freely given and done for us. It's a conversation about faith and about discipleship. And what is required if we want to live freely and faithfully, and experience the abundant life that God is offering us. In, in a sense, it's a conversation about worship. In other words, to whom or to what will we give our hearts and our lives? What is worthy of our very best? On which altar are we, are we offering all that we have and all that we are? Because make no mistake about it, as Will Willimon said many years ago, all of us are offering our lives, the lives of our families, the lives of those closest to us on the altar of some God. We're all sacrificing to something. It might be success, it could be wealth, it could be position, it might be po politics, could be, even be family. The question is, are we laying our lives on the altar of the God of life who alone can save us and set us free? The word worship simply means to accord worth or true value to something or to someone. To recognize something for the value, the worth that it has. And so this brief encounter between Jesus and the religious leaders is a way into considering what it means to give God all that God is worth. In other words, what might life be like if we truly rendered to God all that God is worth? If we give to God those things that belong to God. In doing so, 
Jesus seems to be saying, we just might find that we're less anxious, less afraid, less frantic, less worried, less depressed, less overwhelmed, and therefore we're more free, joyful, hope-filled. So he holds it up and asks them, this engraving, who does it look like? And whose name is on it? And they all say, the emperor, it's Caesar. Then give to the emperor what is his, and give to God what belongs to God. One commentator has pointed out that Jesus' admonition to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, to give to the emperor, in other words, what is the emperor's, is a, is a clever response, and perhaps one that is appropriate for people having difficulty deciding what goes where. So rather than providing a formula for how we can divide out some of our treasure for Caesar, in other words, some of our treasure for those things that are not God and not specifically for the mission of God, and then whatever is left over, we give to God in the mission of God. Rather than providing a, a formula for offering our time and, an, uh, and our energy and our gifts here and some there, Jesus may have been making the point that in the end, it all belongs to God. Nothing is Caesar's, the emperor's. Maybe Jesus was saying, that what we believe we own or is due us is actually on loan to us. Even the emperor's wealth was not his to keep. Caesar may have stamped his image on the coin of the realm, but just like you and me, we, we who mark our property and our time and our treasure with our name and our signature and our account numbers, um, nothing belongs to Caesar or to us. It all belongs to God. It all came from God, it all returns to God. It's all a gift. And, and I think Jesus was trying to help us see that only living in a, with an awareness of that truth can we hope to find peace and freedom and joy and life. I mean, think of all the, the disruptions in our hearts and families, communities, and between nations because we, we cling to and pursue and give our lives to those things, worship those things we believe are rightfully ours, but will never satisfy us or set us free. Think of the parable of the Good Samaritan where the religious leaders came to put Jesus to the test, asking him, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus responds by turning the question on its head, Reminding them that what really matters is, are we being a neighbor? And so here again, Jesus turns the table, turns the world right side up, if you will. They try and put Jesus to the test, basically asking him, Lord, what's lawful? What's legal? That's the wrong question, Jesus says. The point is not what is lawful. All kinds of things are lawful. The question is, what is faithful? We're accountable to God for how we use all that we are and all that we've been given because discipleship isn't about keeping God in some sort of balance with all the other demands on our lives and our time and our gifts. Discipleship, being the church, the body of Christ, is about day by day taking a step closer to Jesus who said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your might and all your soul. Jesus longs for all, for all of us, for, for our hearts. And friends, therein lies freedom and life. Thomas Kelly was a Quaker missionary and scholar. In his a Testament of Devotion, written a number of years ago, um, which is now still, this section, very current and contemporary, he offers this observation. We are trying to be, he writes, several selves at once without all of ourselves being organized by a single mastering life within us each of us tends to be not a single self but a whole committee of selves i love that phrase and each of ourselves is in turn a rank individualist 
not cooperative, but shouting out his vote loudly for himself when the voting time comes. It's as if we have a chairman of our committee of many selves within us who doesn't integrate the many selves into one, but merely counts the votes at each decision point and leaves disgruntled minorities in the wake. We are not integrated, Kelly writes. We are more often distraught. We feel honestly the pull of many obligations and try and fulfill them all. But life is meant to be lived from a center, from a divine center. Most of us, I fear, have not surrendered all else in order to, attain, to attend the holy within. Maybe you felt that way, like life is like that. A, a, like you're made up of a committee of competing selves. Each shouting loudly for your time and attention, demanding that you fulfill their obligations, like life is no longer integrated into some kind of meaningful whole. Maybe even your life of faith, your, 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 your relationship with God and the church has, has come to feel like just one more competing priority on a list of too many competing priorities. So today Jesus says to anxious, frantic, worn out, divided people, this engraving, who does it look like? Whose name and image are on it? And we say, it's George Washington, or Abe Lincoln, or whomever. Well then, give George Washington, or Abe Lincoln, or whomever, what is his. And give God what belongs to God. It sounds a bit ridiculous when we put it that way. And yes, we have obligations and responsibilities to meet. There are things that are lawful. But those are not our God. They cannot set us free or save us. And they will never satisfy the longing of our hearts. Only a, a healthy, meaningful relationship with God can do that. And only God is worthy of our worship. Because life itself is a windfall. Um, I do wonder sometimes, because I've experienced it, um, what if the struggle here to make sense of the demands and the priorities, what if the struggle here is made worse in part simply because we've gotten some things out of order? What if we're like the Pharisees, the religious leaders, trying to work the system and figure out a formula when the only formula that matters is, is the one in which we give Christ our hearts and everything else finds its proper place. Not that life will be necessarily less hectic or, or, or demanding and all, or be all rainbows and unicorns, but that life will be less of a burden and more a joyful gift lived from a divine center. That's what today is about. The past three weeks, that's what any of our work around stewardship and generosity are about. They are not about the budget. If you don't hear anything else, I need you to hear this. It is not about the budget. It is not about fundraising. It is not about propping up the institution of the church. It is not about running a religious business. It is not about the bottom line. Friends, today is about our lives and how we'll live them. It's about our hearts and who has them. Both our individual hearts and the heart of this church. Jesus talked a lot about money, as I said last week. And he talked about money not because he was worried about spreadsheets and budgets and paying the bills. He talked about money because he was worried about our heart. He wanted us to be free and filled with hope and joy, not anxious and afraid and worried and worn out and divided and distracted. And that's what I want for us, for each of us, for your families, and for DUMC. I want us to experience the abundant life that only comes when we give Jesus our hearts, when we invest in things that are eternal, 
And, and when, when we can see that, that no matter whose image is on our treasure, it all belongs to God. And, and God doesn't want us to be a slave to things, but free to invest in, in God's mission of making a better world. So what if we invest ourselves, our time, our gifts, our treasure, what if we invest our very best in God's mission of making a better world? What might God do with us and through us? How might North Mecklenburg County be different? Um, Maybe no one hungry for bread or for God. Maybe no one unsheltered. Maybe no sick person without proper care, no, no prisoner feeling unloved or un, unwanted. Maybe no one turned away from the doors of the church. All welcome. Maybe no one bearing life's burdens alone. I mean, why not? Why can't that be? There were 11 disciples, some women to straighten them out and keep them, hold them accountable, a few of their friends. And Jesus changed the world, friends. He upended an empire. I mean, all we need is a little faith and some imagination for what God might do with us if we give God our very best. In a few moments, I'm going to invite us all to come come forward to place a pledge card in in one of the baskets that you see up, up front. Um, if you don't have a card and would, would like one, there are ushers who can, can get you one. Um, if you'll just let them know, they'll be happy to bring you uh, a card. Um, complete it, bring it forward, place it in one of the baskets up front, or if you prefer, in one of the offering cabinets that are at the doors of the sanctuary. If you need more time, take it home with you, think about it, pray about it. And, and, and if please hear this, if um, how your finances work, how you get paid, how you give makes it difficult to put a number on a piece of paper, then just write something up like, I'll be generous next year, whatever you want to say. Um, I'll commit to pray for the church, be generous, serve, however you want to phrase it. Because this isn't a contract, it's, it's a covenant, it's an act of worship. And it's about taking another step towards Jesus and giving him more and more of our hearts, and giving God our very best. So I invite you to come, place your cards in the baskets. The altar will be open if you'd like to remain here for a few moments and pray for one another, pray for DUMC and our ministries and our mission, and I invite you to do that. Come, and friends, let us render to God the things that belong to God, and give God our very best, give God our hearts. Uh, for the sake of Christ and his mission of making a better world. I invite you to come.